Since the dawn of the science of warfare, when battle became more than two groups simply slogging it out until one was annihilated, armies have long recognized the importance of capturing the high ground. Achieving this aim affords commanders the ability to oversee and dominate the surrounding land, as well as provide a more advantageous position for defense against an oncoming attack. In the 20th century, the high ground was higher than ever before, as mankind began to master the art of powered flight. A significant chapter in the story of modern warfare in the 20th century is one of how the airplane went from rather humble beginnings as something of a curiosity or even a fad to a true necessity of waging a successful war. Trillions upon trillions of dollars were spent and continue to be spent to produce the most sophisticated aircraft the world has ever seen in order to dominate the enemy through the use of air power. However, part of the use of air power is to deny the enemy the use of their own combat aviation assets. This is the realm of the air superiority fighter, warplanes whose sole purpose is to clear the skies of opposing aircraft so that friendly aircraft can go about their business of conducting reconnaissance, carrying out transport tasks, and of course, obliterating the enemy on the ground with bombs. Like many a weapon of the 20th century and beyond, the air superiority fighter was birthed in the arena of World War I and in the skies over the mud and blood of the trenches. In today's episode, we are going to examine some of the early experiments in air combat in the conflict's earliest days and how these evolved until finally the Germans were able to achieve, for the first time in history, air supremacy over the Allies. This is the story of the Fokker Scourge and the first battle for air supremacy. Welcome to Wars of the World. But before we get any further in today's episode, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Enlisted. Enlisted is a World War II multiplayer shooter that focuses on being truly authentic while making sure you don't feel like you're in a history lesson rather than an action-packed game. Enlisted is available on any game's console you like, including PC, Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, and PlayStation 5 and 4 with full support. It's also completely free to play, so you can download the game today and start playing. We've really enjoyed being able to play specific campaigns, including the invasion of Normandy, but there's loads of others to choose from, including the battle for Moscow. Enlisted has great capacity for customization, where you can choose the weaponry, equipment, and vehicles you play with, and build up squads to complement each other and become even stronger. The game is free to play and has great historical content while remaining engaging to play with realistic weapons and vehicles to unlock as you do. Use our link in the description to get playing for free today, as well as get access to an exclusive bonus of three days premium time and several orders for troops when signing up using our link in the description. See you on the battlefield. Given how intertwined the airplane is in the modern world, it's difficult to fathom just how new an invention it was when Europe was set ablaze on July 28, 1914. The Wright brothers' historic first flight on December 17, 1903 was barely 10 years prior, and yet now the airplane was expected to participate in the greatest clash of empires for over a century. All the major combatants had formed dedicated flying services within their armies and navies to handle the machines, but much of their inventories were only barely airworthy and often more akin to prototypes or experimental designs than tried and tested aircraft. Many, and not without some merit, still felt the aircraft too immature to participate in the war in the summer of 1914, but nevertheless, 
the military aviation pioneers of the day were keen to demonstrate their potential and took to the skies in pursuit of the enemy. The primary role envisioned for aircraft was that of reconnaissance, and in the early months of the war, which at that time was still fluid in nature, the speed at which they could cover terrain and their god's eye view made them invaluable assets. They very quickly proved their worth, and more aircraft were ordered from manufacturers, but there were those who thought they could take on a more aggressive role. From its earliest inception, there had been a drive to arm the aeroplane. With even the Wright brothers sketching versions of their historic aircraft fitted with a machine gun in 1903, by 1914, very light armaments were beginning to appear, such as 20-pound bombs thrown over the side by the pilot or his observer, but these often imposed crippling performance penalties on the early aircraft. With so many beginning to fill the skies above the vast line of trenches being dug from the Belgian coast to the south of France, it was inevitable that machines from opposing sides would meet one another. Early missions were flown with airmen having little more than a pistol or bolt-action rifle with which to fire at an enemy aircraft, with scoring a single hit being about 10% skill and 90% luck. Indeed, the first air-to-air -air victory achieved by one pilot over another occurred on August 25th when Peter N. Nesterov of the Imperial Russian Army rammed an Austro-Hungarian aircraft after firing off his entire stock of pistol rounds at the target. The resulting collision killed him and the two Austro-Hungarians flying his target aircraft. Obviously, such a tactic was not an acceptable method of destroying enemy planes, and this led to some bizarre experiments, probably the most well-known of which was when some Russian pilots experimented with towing an anchor with which to snag German planes this reportedly achieving some minor successes early on. Then, on October 5, 1914, Sergeant Joseph Franz and Corporal Louis Quenault of the French Army succeeded in bringing down a German aircraft with gunfire. The reason they had been successful when so many others had failed was simple. Their biplane was fitted with an 8mm Hotchkiss machine gun on the nose. However, it was not simply a case of fitting machine guns to every plane in case they encountered an enemy aircraft. Many couldn't carry the weight of the weapon and its ammunition, leading to increasing demands for newer, more powerful machines. There was also the matter of aiming. The vast majority of aircraft were tractor types, with the propeller at the front of the aircraft, but this meant that when attacking another aircraft in the forward hemisphere, any machine guns on the plane had to be fired around the propeller's arc, lest the pilot shoot it off, turning his machine into a glider. Aiming was therefore extremely difficult, and so most aircraft were fitted with a gun in the rear cockpit, mounted on a pivot. While this afforded a good field of fire in every direction except straight ahead, it required the aircraft to be moving away from the target when firing. An obvious drawback, since an enemy could simply turn away as the pilot tried to get his observer into a good firing position. Alternatively, there were pusher-type aircraft, such as Franz and Quenold's Voisin. These didn't have the problem of firing around the propeller, allowing a pilot and observer to attack head-on. However, they were generally more difficult to fly and had inferior performance. As for using the gun to attack an enemy aircraft, it required a great deal of coordination between pilot and gunner, something that was extremely difficult in the noisy and drafty area of the sky, and even when mastered, the communication between the two often delayed response times. What was needed was a way for a single pilot to be able to adequately fly and aim his gun at the same time, to turn the plane into part of the weapon, and as 1915 dawned, just such a weapon of the skies was about to be fielded. Dutchman Anthony Fokker was born in the Dutch East Indies, modern-day Indonesia, on April 6, 1890. With the birth of flights coinciding with his teenage years, Fokker was soon enthralled with aircraft, particularly after viewing demonstrations by the Wright brothers in France. In 1910, he was sent by his family to study car mechanics in Germany, but his passion remained in the sky, and so he changed his vocation to aeronautics, constructing his first aircraft that same year, which he named the Spider. The Spider came to an unfortunate end when a friend of his crashed it into a tree, but undeterred, 
Fokker created a second, and after demonstrating it and his paper designs to investors, in 1912, he succeeded in opening an aircraft factory near Berlin before transferring to Schwerin. The outbreak of the war saw the German government seize the factory in order to meet its requirements for military aircraft, with Fokker staying on as director. Quickly, it became clear that aircraft were increasingly going to take on a combat role, and like so many other manufacturers, Fokker and his team began designing armed aircraft. Realizing that in order to be effective in destroying an enemy plane, the pilot needs to be able to aim the gun using the aircraft, Fokker ran up against the same problems as other manufacturers, namely the propeller being in the way. It was then he had an idea. What if there was a way of ensuring the guns could only fire when the propeller blade was clear of the line of bullets? That way the pilot could sight down the gun like on the ground and aim by steering the aircraft. In truth, it was not a wholly new idea, and a handful of engineers in both France and Germany had produced patents and even prototypes for such devices to essentially synchronize the propeller and gun, but none had been made to work. French pilot Roland Garris and engineer Raymond Saulnier were forced to give up their effort to create such a mechanism, and instead resorted to using armored wedges on the propeller that would deflect any bullets that struck it. Using this new propeller, Garros shot down three German planes in April 1915, but was then himself brought down behind German lines. Noting Garros' success, German authorities looked to replicate the armored wedge propeller design, believing this was the solution to their problem, but instead, it created a whole host of other issues. Firstly, the armored wedges were too weak to be effective in protecting the propeller from the more powerful German ammunition, which would be hitting them at their maximum velocity. And even if they weren't, the French discovered that after several seconds of fire, their effectiveness was significantly reduced, meaning the gun still posed a danger to the propeller, and they would have to be replaced after every combat. Furthermore, the weight of these wedges diminished propeller performance, and thus, by the same token, the aircraft's overall speed. While Fokker was one of those engineers approached to replicate the wedges for German aircraft, he was unimpressed with them. He felt the engineering work was sloppy and inefficient. Then, 48 hours later, he approached German authorities with an alternative, his own design for a synchronization system. Fokker's design worked differently to the previous efforts, in that instead of trying to interrupt the firing of the gun, the gun could only be fired if two factors were in place, the trigger was pushed, and the propeller was clear. If they weren't, then the whole mechanism wouldn't work, allowing the propeller to pass before they were all in place again and the weapon could resume firing. It was once believed that he designed the system from scratch during those 48 hours, perhaps inspired by remnants of Saulnier's design left in Garrus' aircraft, but it is now widely accepted that he was already working on it prior to Garrus' shootdown, the story being fictitious when recounted in Fokker's biography years later. Suitably impressed with the proposal, the German High Command requested a demonstration, and so Fokker went about installing his design into two Fokker M5K single-seat monoplanes that his company had been producing for the German army. In designing the M5 series of monoplanes, Fokker borrowed heavily from the French Marine Saulnier H, and indeed, on numerous occasions, the British and French mistook them for friendly aircraft when they appeared over the Western Front. Further emphasizing the influence of the Marine, like the original design, the tail and elevators were all moving using wing warping to control the aircraft in flight, while power was derived from a rather lackluster 80 horsepower, seven cylinder rotary engine, a licensed version of the French Gnome Lambda engine. Fokker disliked this engine immensely, describing it as tricky, unreliable, difficult to operate, and consuming an enormous amount of gas and oil for relatively little output. But for the time, it was what he had to work with. In order to achieve synchronization between the gun and the propeller, Fokker connected the mechanism to the engine via a cam that moved two rods when the gun needed to stop firing. Initially, Fokker demonstrated the mechanism's effectiveness by replacing the propeller with a wooden disc upon which two marks were made for where the propeller blades would have been. After firing the gun, the disc was punctured with holes right the way around except for where the propellers were painted. 
The German army then demanded flying demonstrations, and Fokker took two aircraft fitted with his mechanism to Stene in German-occupied northeastern France, where on June 13, 1915, he conducted strafing runs against ground targets in front of previously skeptical frontline officers. Further demonstrations were made at the front, including in front of Crown Prince Wilhelm, Kaiser Wilhelm's son, who commanded the 5th Army, to further influence the frontline pilots who would be expected to fly the new aircraft and its weapon into combat, Lieutenant Otto Parschau joined Fokker during the demonstration. Yet despite the success of these demonstrations, there was still a nagging feeling amongst many officers that Fokker's design would only look good on a firing range, and that it wouldn't stand up to the rigors of combat. Therefore, they demanded a real test, one against the British and the French, where all doubt would be erased forever. Being the most knowledgeable person available on both the M5K and the working of the mechanism, and of course with his reputation on the line, it made sense for Fokker himself to carry out this combat demonstration. However, this presented a problem, since while he was working for the Germans, he was in fact a Dutch citizen, and Holland was formally neutral in the war. Disregarding this, over a period of a week, Fokker, sporting a German uniform and with fake ID papers, began flying his aircraft on what could be considered the first true combat air patrols in the world's first true fighter. He stayed over German lines in case he was shot down or suffered a mechanical failure, which might hand his revolutionary design over to the Western Allies, instead seeking out British or French scouts peering down at German trenches. Accounts differ on what exactly happened during these flights. Some claim he failed to find any aircraft to shoot at, while others say he spotted a lowly French two-seater scout crossing over German lines. He maneuvered into attack from above, when he suddenly found himself unable to pull the trigger at another aircraft with two human beings on board. He therefore left the French aircraft to continue its flight unchallenged, and when he landed, he reportedly told a colleague that he was going to leave the killing to the Germans themselves. Exactly which is true is unclear. Fokker then returned to his factory at Schwerin, but left behind his armed prototypes, which were instead placed in the hands of two pilots who would soon become legends in the annals of aviation history. Oswald Bulke and Max Emelman. Both men were eager supporters of the new aircraft, and began work on developing tactics for its use. However, it would be another pilot who would claim the accolade of achieving the first kill in the M5K using Fokker's synchronization gear. Lieutenant Kurt Wintgens hailed from a proud Prussian military family and had barely completed his flying training when he found himself at the controls of the revolutionary aircraft on July 1st, 1915. The 20-year-old pilot was already rather unique in the German army, being the only airman formally permitted to wear corrective lenses. During the late afternoon, Wintgens wandered over the French line, where he spotted a French Type L parasol two-seater scout plane. Recounting the battle in a letter to a friend he wrote the next day, Wintgens said, I had flown to the front a couple of times without seeing an opponent, until yesterday evening when the big moment came. Time, six o'clock. Place, east of Luneville. Altitude between 2,000 and 2,500 meters. Suddenly, I notice a monoplane in front of me about 300 meters higher. At the same moment, he had already dived in front of me, fiercely firing his machine gun decently. But as I, at once, dived in an opposite direction under him, he missed wildly. After four attacks, I reached his altitude in a large turn, and now my machine gun did some talking. I attacked at such a close distance that we looked each other in the face. After my third attack, he did the most stupid thing he could do, fled. I turned the crate on the spot and had him at once, beautifully in my sight. Rapid fire for about four seconds, and down went his nose. I could follow him until 500 meters. Then, unfortunately, I was fired upon from the ground too hotly, the fight being far over the French lines. As it happened, the French plane, despite being crippled, managed to land safely. However, because German authorities couldn't confirm his claim, Wintgens was not credited with the victory nor a second that he achieved three days later. 
Vinguns would have to wait until July 15th when he engaged and shot down another Type L to be formally credited with the first victory using Fokker's synchronization gear. Vintguns would achieve yet another first a few months later when he shot down Victor Chapman, the first American pilot to be killed in the war. He was himself shot down on September 25th, 1915, after achieving 19 victories in air combat, 14 in Fokker's fighter. Few on the Allied side at this early juncture appreciated just what Vintguns had initiated in July of 1915. It was the start of what they would remember as the Fokker Scourge and what history remembers as the first battle for air superiority over a battlefield. A new era in warfare had just begun. Back at Schwerin, Fokker was now having to contend with orders for his revolutionary new design. At first, the remaining M5s under construction were reworked to the new armed design before the first purpose-built examples were produced, these differing from their predecessors by having their wings moved from the high shoulder position lower down, making them mid-wing monoplanes. They also differed in that the Parabellum NG-14 machine gun fitted to the prototypes, which had proved rather troublesome, were replaced by the 7.92mm Spandau IMG-08 machine gun. Still powered by the U.0 engine, it had a top speed of 81 miles per hour, only marginally faster than most two-seat scouts flown by the British and French, which would be the type's main quarry. Given how revolutionary the new aircraft was, it didn't seem fitting to continue to refer to them by the old designation, and so a new one was applied. The E-1 with the E standing for Eindecker, meaning monoplane. Orders for the E-1 put a tremendous burden on Fokker's manufacturing teams, who had not only had orders from the German army, but the Austro-Hungarian army as well. As if this were not stressful enough for the Dutchman, he was also facing legal action from engineer August Euler, who claimed that having patented the idea for synchronizing a gun to an aircraft's propeller in 1912, Fokker had basically stolen it and was getting all the widespread acclaim. Production struggled to meet demand, and the Eindeckers trickled out of Schwerin to frontline flying units, despite Fokker expanding his staff. When the aircraft reached the front, there was still some debate as how best to employ them. Eventually, it was decided to assign a small number of Eindeckers to the reconnaissance units, usually a single example for every six of what other aircraft was assigned. Given that there was no formal training program for air combat, in the opening months of its employment, the most experienced pilots took turns to fly the Eindecker in between their regular duties, passing on knowledge of their experiences to their comrades in order to build a pool of expertise. Oswald Belke would become a master in the field of air combat at this time, not only for his score, but his ability to formalize and then teach the methods he had learned in the field. Belke's first victory came three days after Vintgen's first encounter, but it was not in an Eindecker. Instead, on July 4th, 1915, he was flying an Albatross C-1 along with his observer when they spotted another French Type L parasol scout and managed to bring it down. It would not be until August 19th that he would raise his tally exponentially with the Eindeckers when he shot down a British biplane and five more aircraft would fall to his guns before the year was out. An extraordinary achievement, given how ineffective air combat had been prior. Belke would ultimately form the first rules for air combat, many of which continue to ring true today. His dicta Belke, as it was referred to, demanded, amongst others, that pilots secure the advantage before attacking, keep the sun behind them. If their opponent dives on them, don't flee, but fight and always carry through with their attack. Belke, Emelman, Vintgens, and other early pioneers of fighter combat soon began perfecting the formula of engaging the British and French planes. Where possible, they would engage from the rear and above the target, this giving them more time to line up their shots than from any other quarter, where the target would be much more difficult to aim at. Given that observers of two-seaters often had weapons of their own, surprise was also a key ingredient, as just one lucky rifle shot could hit a vital engine component in the Eindecker, or worse, the even more vital pilot. The similarity of the Eindecker to its Moraine ancestor certainly helped, as Allied pilots continued to occasionally mistake the German plane for an ally. 
Even if the pilot and observer of the target did spot the attacking Eindecker pursuing them from the rear, with Fokker's revolutionary mechanisms still a relatively unknown factor among the British and French, many of their flyers actually felt safe, seeing the German plane behind them, believing that his own propeller was blocking his fire. That false sense of security lasted right up until bullets started tearing into their fuselage. Given that even in ideal circumstances there was a chance that the intended victim might survive the attack, Eimelman conceived of a maneuver which would become known as the Eimelman Turn to allow a second attack. Having passed the target, Eimelman would then climb back up past the enemy aircraft and just short of stalling at the top, apply full rudder to yaw his aircraft around. This put his Eindecker facing down at the enemy craft, allowing for him to make another high-speed diving pass. This maneuver would later be widely adopted by fighter pilots on all sides. However, the situation was still far from ideal for the new German fighter pilots, for despite its revolutionary capability to fire through the propeller, the Eindecker was still an old design of an aircraft for 1915, which suffered from a crippling lack of power from its 80 horsepower engine. Recognizing this early on, Anthony Fokker had already begun work and testing on an improved variant, which as well as receiving a more powerful 100 horsepower rotary engine, also featured a reduced wingspan, both of which worked to give it a top speed of 87 miles per hour. But this came at the cost of its rate of climb, and pilots reported it didn't handle as well as the original. Identified as the Fokker E2, the aircraft was produced alongside the original, 54 E1s and 49 E2s were eventually manufactured. As losses began to rise dramatically compared to previous months, Allied commanders began to realize that something new was afoot. The number of kills achieved by the Eindeckers was aided by the dramatic increase in the number of aircraft at the front, as the realization of their usefulness had led to a surge in aircraft production, particularly in Britain. For Allied pilots, the appearance of the Eindecker was akin to some sort of mythological monster, and a mystique was generated about its capabilities, with them being unaware that many of their aircraft had either comparable or even superior performance, but lacked the synchronized gun that made the German aircraft so lethal. And lethal it was. Between July and December 1915, Eindeckers accounted for a previously unprecedented 84 Allied machines destroyed. In short, where Eindeckers operated, the Germans had almost complete control of the air. They had achieved air supremacy. By October 1915, British commanders began expressing concerns that their pilots were experiencing trepidation about flying near the German lines where Eindeckers were known to operate, and requested something be done. With thousands of men being slaughtered in no man's land below, the concerns of a comparatively tiny handful of flyers met with little sympathy from senior officers, who responded with demands that every man do his duty. Many Allied flyers thus began taking matters into their own hands, either crudely adapting their aircraft for air combat, or developing tactics for cooperative protection. Machine guns were placed on aircraft never intended for combat, such as the British BE-2C, these being angled away from the propeller, meaning in order to hit an Eindecker, the pilots had to aim to the left or right of their target. Pilots, realizing they had little chance of hitting them this way, instead settled for simply harrying or warding off an attacking Eindecker. However, the reallocation of aircraft to anti-Fokker duties had the knock-on effect that the number of reconnaissance and bombing missions the Allies were able to carry out plummeted. While history lords the Eindecker for its lethality during this period, the fact is its impact on the Allies went far beyond the number of aircraft it downed. Clearly, the Allied powers needed an effective answer to the Eindecker, and the race was on to produce aircraft to blunt the lethal Fokkers. Lacking their own version of the synchronization gear meant that they instead had to perfect the methods already employed. Working for the French Newport Company, aircraft designer Gustave Delage developed the Newport 11, which featured a single Lewis machine gun affixed to the top of the upper wing to fire over the propeller. While somewhat awkward, a skilled pilot could become just as lethal as the Eindeckers once accustomed to operating a gun this way. The British, meanwhile, introduced the Royal Aircraft Factory FE-2, a new pusher-type aircraft with a crew of two, 
armed with one or even two machine guns that could be swung around onto a target. This was eventually followed by the Airco DH-2, again, another pusher type, but one that was far more refined than the FE-2. This was a single-seat fighter, equipped with a fixed, forward-firing Lewis gun, and possessed all-round superior performance to both the E-1 and E-2. Anthony Fokker was not resting on his hands either, and was already working to produce an E-3 variant of his aircraft by the end of 1915. The E-3 featured the improved E-2's more powerful engine, greater fuel capacity, and a redesigned and more efficient wing. The E-3 would become the definitive variant of the Eindecker, and 249 would be produced. But sadly for the Germans, the introduction of the newer Allied fighting scouts meant that going into 1916, its advantage was slowly being eroded away. While some E-3s would see prolonged use on the Eastern Front against Russia in the hands of the Germans and the Ottoman army, the Russian aircraft being generally inferior to their Western Allies' machines, by 1916, the tables had turned to such an extent that now it was the Eindeckers who were being massacred without mercy. The final nail in the type's coffin came near the end of that month, when the first operational British fighters with their own synchronization gears appeared. Again, having recognized this, even as work was progressing on the E3, Fokker was designing an even more powerful and capable version. The E4 was essentially a lengthened Fokker E3 and was powered by a 160 horsepower two row 14 cylinder rotary engine. Again, another copy of a French engine, this time the known double lambda. As well as giving greater performance, the more powerful engine was intended to enable the Eindecker to carry two or even three machine guns, dramatically increasing its firepower as well as providing redundancy if one gun jammed. A common occurrence at the time that would see any of the previous Eindeckers have to flee from combat. On paper, the E-4 outperformed even the new Allied fighters, the U-3 engine dragging it along to a top speed of 110 miles per hour, but the E-4 was a troubled aircraft. The more powerful engine actually caused a reduction in agility, a factor that was becoming increasingly appreciated in combat between aircraft, which pilots likened to that of a dogfight. It was also found that after just a few hours of use, the engine began to lose its efficiency, meaning it was extremely maintenance heavy, something that was out of the question in the field. 49 E-4s were produced, and their introduction was slow, meaning that by the time the last was delivered in December 1916, it was hopelessly obsolete. And once again, another quick thanks to Enlisted for sponsoring today's episode. Don't forget to check out the game using our link down below to get a great bonus to start off the proper way. The term Fokker Scourge was coined by the press after the Eindeckers had been nullified and has since been used to describe this dark chapter of the Allies' air war. From that point on, all major air operations included the use of fighting scouts to clear the skies of the enemy, and from 1916 onwards, dogfights grew in intensity and complexity. Fokker and his company would continue building aircraft for the Germans, and this would include probably the most famous aircraft of the entire war, the distinctive Fokker DR-1 triplane, which served as the mount of the legendary Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron himself. Neither Fokker, nor Belke, or any of those early fighter pilot pioneers could ever have imagined how air combat would evolve over the decades that followed. Today, supersonic aircraft operating in teams linked together by datalink computers and forged in stealth design to make them difficult to detect can blast enemy aircraft out of the sky at ranges many times beyond the sight of a pilot. And now, in the waning years of the first quarter of the 21st century, we are on the cusp of unmanned fighters flying alongside their manned counterparts, doubling a pilot's firepower, acting as a decoy, or if necessary, sacrificing itself to save the live pilot. And it all began with Fokker and the Eindeckers.